Hatchet Chapter 11 There were these things to do. He transferred all the eggs from the small beach into the shelter, reburying them near his sleeping area. It took all his will to keep from eating another one as he moved them, but he got it done, and when they were out of sight again, it was easier. He added wood to the fire and cleaned up the camp area. A good laugh, that cleaning up the camp. All he did was shake out his windbreaker and hang it up in the sun to dry, the berry juice that had soaked in, and smooth the sand where he slept. But it was a mental thing. He had gotten depressed thinking about how they hadn't found him yet. And when he was busy and had something to do, the depression seemed to leave. So there were these things to do. With the camp squared away, he brought in more wood. He had decided to always have enough on hand for three days. And after spending one night with the fire for a friend, he knew what a staggering amount of wood it would take. He worked all through the morning at the wood, breaking down dead limbs and breaking or chopping them into smaller pieces, sorting them neatly beneath the overhang. He stopped once to take a drink at the lake, and, his, and in his reflection he saw the swelling on his hand was nearly gone. There was no pain there, so he assumed that had taken care of itself. His leg was also back to normal, although he had a small pattern of holes, roughly star-shaped, where the quills had nailed him. And while he was standing at the lake shore, taking stock, he noticed that his body was changing. He had never been fat, but he had been slightly heavy, with a little extra weight just above his belt at the sides. This was completely gone, and his stomach had caved into the hunger and the sun that had cooked him past burning. So he was tanning, and with the smoke from the fire, his face was starting to look like leather. But perhaps more than his body was the change in his mind, or in the way he was, was becoming. I am not the same, he thought. I see, I hear differently. He did not know when the change started, but it was there. When a sound came to him now, he didn't just hear it, but would know the sound. He would swing and look at it, a breaking twig of movement of air, and know the sound as if he somehow can move his mind back down the wave of the sound to the source. He could know what the sound was before he quite realized he had heard it, and when he saw something, a bird moving, a twig inside a bush, or a ripple on the water, he would truly see that thing, not just notice it, as he used to notice things in the city. He would see all the parts of it, see the whole twig, the feathers, see the color of the feathers, see the bush, and the size and shape and color of its leaves. He would see the way the light moved with the ripples on the water, and see that the wind made the ripples, and which way that the wind had to blow to make the ripples move in that certain way. None of that used to be in Brian, and now it was a part of him, a changed part of him, a grown part of him. And the two things, his mind and his body, had come together as well, had made a connection with each other that he didn't quite understand. When his ears heard a sound or his eyes saw a sight, his mind took control of his body. Without his thinking, he moved to face the sound or sight, moved to make ready for it to deal with it. There were these things to do. When the wood was done, he decided to get a signal fire ready. He moved to the top of the rock ridge that comprised the bluff over his shelter and was pleased to find a large flat stone area. More wood, he thought, moaning inwardly. He went back to the fallen trees and found more dead limbs, carrying them up on the rock until he had enough for a bonfire. Initially, he had thought of making a signal fire every day, but he couldn't. He would never be able to keep the wood supply going. So while he was working, he decided to have the fire ready, and if he heard an engine, or even thought he heard a plane engine, he would run up with a burning limb and set off the signal fire. Things to do. At the last trip to the top of the stone bluff with wood, he stopped, sat on the point overlooking the lake, and rested. The lake lay before him, twenty or so feet below, 
and he had not seen it in this way since he had come in with the plane. Remembering the crash, he had a moment of fear, a breath-tightening little rip of terror, but it passed, and he was quickly caught up in the beauty of the scenery. It was so incredibly beautiful that it was almost unreal. From his height, he could see not just the lake, but across part of the forest, a green carpet. It was full of life, birds, insects. There was a constant hum and song. At the other end of the bottom of the L, there was another large rock sticking out over the water, and on top of the rock, a snaggly pine had somehow found food and grown, bent and gnarled. Sitting on the limb was a bluebird with a crest and sharp beak, a kingfisher, he thought of a picture he had seen once, which left the branch while he watched and dove into the water. It emerged a split part of a second later. In its mouth was a small fish, wiggling silver in the sun. It took the fish to the limb, juggled it twice, and swallowed it whole. Fish, of course, he thought. There were fish in the lake, and they were food. And if a bird could do it, he scrambled down the side of the bluff and trotted to the edge of the lake, looking down into the water. Somehow, it had never occurred to him to look inside the water, only at the surface. The sun was flashing back up into his eyes, and he moved off to the side and took his shoes off and waded out 15 feet. Then he turned and stood still, with the sun at his back, and studied the water again. It was, he saw after a moment, literally packed with life. Small fish swam everywhere, some narrow and long, some round, most of them three or four inches long, some a bit larger, and many smaller. There was a patch of mud off to the side, leading into deeper water, and he could see old clam shells there, so there must be clams. As he watched, a crayfish looking like a tiny lobster, left one of the empty clam shells and went into another, looking for something to eat, digging with its claws. While he stood, some of the small, roundish fish came quite close to his legs, and he tensed, got ready, and made a wild stab at grabbing one of them. They exploded away in a hundred flicks of quick light, so fast that he had no hope of catching them that way. But they soon came back seemed to be curious about him, and as he walked from the water, he tried to think of a way to use that curiosity to catch them. He had no hooks or string, but if he could somehow lure them into the shallows and make a spear, a small fish spear, he might be able to strike fast enough to get one. He would have to find the right kind of wood, slim and straight. He had seen some willows up along the lake that might work, and he could use the hatchet to sharpen it and make it while he was sitting by the fire tonight. And that brought up the fire, which he had to feed again. He looked at the sun and saw it was getting late in the afternoon. And when he thought of how late it was, he thought that he ought to reward all his work with another egg. And that made him think that some kind of dessert would be nice. He smiled when he thought of dessert, so fancy. And he wondered if he should move up the lake and see if... He could find some raspberries after he banked the fire. And while he was looking for the right wood for a spear. Spear wood, he thought, and it all rolled together, just rolled together and rolled over him. There were these things to do.